I've fallen in love with lots of women in my life. Right. But I first, my the first wife I married was my first love, and she was a very, very sweet, beautiful woman. I've always been lucky to attract beautiful women. Absolutely. Um, and and uh, attractive pardon? Man. pardon? You're a very attractive man. <laughs> I don't know where, but uh, anyway, Absolutely. I had um, this first love, but she died on my son's wedding day. Right. And she right. was only 48. So right. I know what it's like to bring tragedy into my own heart, right. in my own doorstep. Um, right. And so now my eldest son, who's 53, when he celebrates right. his wedding, right anniversary right. it's 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 tinted with sorrow uh, what happened was that you know she sacrificed her life for me right. and then I, I ungratefully left her for another woman which is also another bad thing in my conscience I am not the man you probably think I have done lots of things outside of my work which I'm not proud of and now when my wife died I look I've been married four times nearly right. so I, I actually have a conscience I have a guilt right. which I'm carrying and uh, I, I'm constantly reflecting looking back you know and this has got nothing to do with my photography it's right. to do with my humanity my right. existence right. as a man right. be waving goodbye to them and they would look at me and saying, is that fool going to come back alive or maybe with a leg missing? I knew that. I could see the expression. Um, and it was and my children were little children. They would wave goodbye to me. Right. And when I came back, it was wonderful, right. of course. But, you know, I ran a terrific Russian roulette game yeah. with my life. Right. And I, my father was a gambler. We were very poor when I was a kid, right. more than you could imagine. Right. We lived in two rooms below the... Right the level of the ground in London. We were very poor and there was no toilet, no bathroom, no money, no food. I was always wearing second-hand clothes. I know about poverty, I know about the humility of, of trying to come to terms with and I had a huge inferiority complex on my shoulder sitting here until I was about 30. And then when I, I knew the world and I tried to come to terms with who I was, what I I, I, got, I, I got rid of that. I got rid of my inferiority complex. Oh, I, I would prepare myself to leave and then I would leave. A chauffeur would come to the house and take me away and I'd look back at this little family and I could see it in their eyes. They were saying, you know, why is he doing this? Well, a friend of mine was killed in Cambodia a week before I got there. And now I've seen his wife over the years yeah. and when she was sitting talking to me I could see in her eyes looking into mine she was saying why was it him who survived and not my husband I can psychologically right. sense this in her right. in her observation of, right. of this meeting and, and one of her daughters who's now a grown-up woman right. she's very angry with her father she told me she said I was so angry with my father was saying how dare you go away and be killed and leave me as a child. Do you think she's right in that? Yeah, she's dead she's right. Of course right. she is. Right. I mean, it was a selfish thing to do to bring a family into the world. Absolutely. It's okay if you're a single man. Yeah. Okay, go and get killed. Yes. But yes. when you've, you are responsible for a family yes. and, yes. and their emotional attachments yes. to your, yes. your blood, your, yes. uh, you know, it, it's not right. I, I mean, I had a beautiful American wife. She never supported me. She just she was a bloodsucker. <laughs> so she just took all my money, and uh, I didn't have much money, but she took it. And she she was a, not a very honest person. But um, then I had a, a another wife who I didn't marry. So I had a son though. By it. So then then I have now my wife Catherine, who's they're all younger than me. These women. My first children, they are the 53 years yeah, of age, yeah, my yeah. first children, but they forgave me for deserting their mother because I went back when she was dying. Right. So that, they've forgiven me for that. But I, I have a boy who's in the, the, the English Marines. Oh, is it? Yeah, I mean, people say, don't you feel uncomfortable about having a son who's, who's been to Afghanistan in the war? Uh, of course, I, it's, a, it's a bad place for me to be thinking about because they are in my anti-war. But my brother, right. who was in the French Foreign Legion, he said, you did it, I did it, he's doing it. And you can't tell him what to do, even though you're his father. Absolutely. So 
where am I in all this? Where am I? Where do I belong? I mean, I cannot be Mr. 100% right in any decision I make. I'm bound to make a mistake. I've certainly wised up, you're right there, but when, you know, when I persecuted my children for not eating lunch, it was wrong of me. They didn't know about what I'd seen in Biafra. But you were right. But I was right, but I was wrong at the same time, you see. Right. You know, you can't be all things to all men. Yes, I cannot be the man. Right. I'm, right. I'm still half a man. Yes. And so therefore, I, you've got to bear in mind I had no education. I, I grew up with a bunch of thugs and, and, and violence and bigotry. Yeah. So, you know, I've come a long way since those days. I've, I've, I've come away. I'm like a river that's changing course. Mm like the Ganga, I'm changing course, I widen in places and narrow in others. Right. So, at the, end of my, at the end of the day, I will leave behind several books of statements of, of injustice that happened to others, and I will be forgotten. Don't even question me, I will be forgotten eventually, as we all will. But at least I hope I've made a small scratch on the surface of the earth, a small one. No, not really. I do it because I think of the tragedies and the cruelty and the, and the, and the injuries of other human beings. I can't tell you what I, I mean. I, I can tell you. I've, I've actually seen men lying who've been murdered in the Congo with a bullet through there which has taken all their face sure. away. One day I carried a man under, under his arm who had everything from here down to here missing. Two bullets have ripped the whole face. I'm looking right down into the throat with the congealed blood. I am as close as you. I'm, I'm holding him, walking him backwards to a truck. And um, I, I went to the hospital a week later because I fell and broke my arm and all my, in a gun battle. And I went to the same hospital and I said to the doctor, what happened to that man I brought in? He said, he said, he's fine. I thought, what a ridiculous statement. How can you be fine with everything missing? Because you know what they would do? They would take a lump from his buttocks, yeah. a bone from somewhere else, and reconstruct something. And yeah, a form of jaw. Mm. But when you're a 20-year-old man with no face, no woman is going to want you. So I, 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 I add up and add up and add up all the things that are going to come thereafter. Yes, I, I, I've always been reasonably kind and help. I, occasionally in wars I drop my camera and I pick up a victim and carry them away like an old lady in a gun battle or, or a soldier. This is the morality you're talking about. Yeah, the, the morals yeah. are driven by. I, I'm not obliged to do that. You're absolutely no, not. No, no. But uh, the, there was a photo there of a soldier holding two soldiers like a yeah, yeah, yeah. crucifixion, I call it. I took that soldier on my shoulders. Right. When I was 31, I was very strong, yes. and I carried him away from the battle. Because yes. when you're wounded in battle, the last thing you want is another wound. Because yes. you're in a situation where you can't help yourself. So yes. I took him away, and um, I just felt that it made me feel good to do something. Instead of taking a picture, I did some, something better. Yes. I've always been afraid of accusation. I never wanted someone to say, you bastard, you, you did this, or you d should have done that, or did you feel like doing this? Every time I do one of these talks, there's always somebody in the audience who says, have you ever helped anybody? I knew that question's coming. Yeah. I've been around too long. too long. And of course I've done, you know, I've helped people. But yeah. what I said earlier, like you, you see, by helping, you've turned away from your obligation of why you're there. Um, so, you know, as I said earlier, you can't be perfect. I don't think deviating would be a crime by helping somebody. Um, or I don't even consider it would be unprofessional. But at the same time, you have a, a moment. It's not about moment of glory. It's a moment of conscience and you must make up your mind there and then. Is it worth getting the picture or is it worth helping this person? I would like to be able to do both. <laughs> it's not possible. So, you know, occasionally my, my conscience won't allow me not to help. 
about murdering another man, no. I mean, if I photograph a man murdering another man, is it going to bring any justice to the situation? I mean, another country, I live miles away, thousands of miles, can I come back and make prosecution? You know, whole thing being... I've won the World Press yes, photo, but it makes me feel uncomfortable. The, the prize, I don't want... I have a garden, a big garden in England. Some of the prizes are in the, in, in the shed because I feel bad about the prizes. Right. I feel bad about accepting right. uh, the English government right. award I have. I feel, I took it, now I think, oh God, should I have taken it? So, so you know, I'm always in that, that place of feeling compromised. It's not a good place to be. On the other hand, it's good to have a conscience. You know, a lot of photojournalists don't have a, a single ounce of conscience. They'll rush in and they'll photograph I'm someone the in the Bangladesh world and you know some of my friends walked away. They wouldn't yeah. do it. I wasn't there. If I was there what would I have done? It's a, it's a question I'm so pleased that I didn't have to answer. Um, but it's, it torments me even though I wasn't there. Uh, what would I have done? That's my big question. This is the man who threatened to kill me. <laughs> and. Uh, this is in Afghanistan. These are the children that were yeah. tied into yeah. the... This is the boy in the Marines now. Ah, in Afghanistan? Yeah, he's 28 years old, he's like huge. He's a very nice boy. This boy was a model in England because he was quite good looking. Oh, he is? Yeah, he's and this is my looking. daughter actually, but anyway. Yeah, now I have another boy who's 13. Wonderful. <laughs> oh, you want me to sign ah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Can you give me a oh, pencil? I'll give you a pen. Okay. Okay. Oh, a fountain pen. I haven't used one of these for a hundred years ago. Um, it's quite a nice pen, actually. Oh, very nice, too. What's your name?